The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, Laura and I last week were in Decorah, Iowa. I I was uh, attending my 40th college reunion. Laura's much younger. It was not her 40th. Um, And we enjoyed worship on Sunday. It was really fun. There, There was a trumpet choir, 25 trumpets. There was another uh, small orchestra. How many choirs? Three choirs, I think, three or five choirs. And we sat in worship. Our friend sat behind us, and he apprenticed with the Chicago Opera. And he sang at our wedding, and Laura's mom said, no voice ever filled that church like Greg's. Um, And I'm intrigued to find that I love being with you and hearing you singing with me. Uh, you don't sing quite as well as Greg <laughs> and those five choirs. But there's something, my first several years here, I used to say, I've, I haven't been here long enough to take the choir for granted. And I still don't think I have. But now I can hear a few voices and think, that's somebody I know well and love. Nice to be with you for worship this morning. Let's pray. Loving God, you grant us gifts beyond measure. Grant us persistence in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I've been living with this parable of Jesus uh, all week. In fact, a little longer since two weeks ago, I knew I wasn't going to preach Sunday. So oh, what's what's coming up October 16th? So I'd already looked at it. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. I like the idea that the parables of Jesus at times are stories that are intended to work on you. I think this is one of those stories. And the work that Jesus wants to do here, Luke suggests, is to compel you to not lose heart. I think that's interesting. Along with this parable, those who choose our lessons to read each Sunday have paired the story of Jacob wrestling the angel in the night. And this is a story I love. And I love the idea of putting it alongside uh, our parable today. I like to think of these uh, texts often as like they're in conversation with each other. In this night wrestling tale, we learn how the people of God were given the name Israel, which which means one who strives with God or God strives. It's probably wise to remind you a few things about the story of Jacob. For starters, his name has a double meaning, doesn't it? Jacob means heel. And Jacob is the younger of twins, right? When, when they were born, Jacob was holding on to the heel 
of Esau. But that name can also mean usurper or the supplanter, the Bible might tell you in the notes, um, maybe more loosely, the cheat. Now remember, he was a conniving fellow, and he and his mother snookered Esau out of the right of being Isaac's heir, right? They tricked his father Isaac into giving him the blessing that rightfully belonged to Esau. Well, in our reading today, Jacob is on his way to meet Esau. And now, many years after all these deceits, he fears that there is a great conflict coming. That's why he is alone on one side of the stream with everything he has on the other side. He's in the midst of trying to re-weasel his way out of the conflict and protect his assets at the same time. That's how Jacob operates in the world always. So one might suggest that Jacob is wrestling with all sorts of issues. And that night he has a somewhat mysterious and mystical wrestling match. And in the end, Jacob gains a new name from the exchange Israel, one who strives with God or God strives. And it's never entirely clear with whom Jacob has his wrestling match. Is it simply his own worries? Is it some night intruder? Is it an angel of the Lord? Or could it be God? Out of the misty shadows of the story, Jacob emerges with a blessing, a new name. And oh yeah, one more thing. A limp, huh? It's an amazing and rich story, a foundational story for the people of Israel, a story to tell the chosen people about who they are. And that makes it a story for you and for me as well. Now, it's interesting how uh, Jacob's receiving a new name is different than most While he gets his new name, he continues with his old name. When Abram becomes Abraham, that's who he is from then on. When Saul becomes Paul, he is Paul ever after. Jacob's new name goes hand in hand with the old. And there's a lot of meaning there too. At the same time, uh, this new name is a name not just for, for Jacob, but for a whole people the people of Israel, the people of promise. In this mysterious story, there are layers upon layers and layers. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. So in part, this name, he strives with God, speaks to the fact that the stories of Scripture in many ways tell us of God who strives to love you no matter what the cost. And I, and I want to wonder, how uh, might it color your vision of who you are? If you were to understand that you are an heir of this legacy, that you too are one who strives with God. Often I think people paint faith as something that's settled. You figure it out. You make some sort of, I guess you make a decision or something, and then you're in. How might your picture of the walk of faith, your walk in this life, be affected? If you were to understand that with God by your side, then life is, at least at times, a struggle with God. The God who is by your side. How might it shape your picture of the faith walk if you would consider that in this struggle with God, you might at times find yourself walking with a limp. It's a profound perspective we're given here in this foundational story 
of who we are. And so I'd love to have that story be in conversation with this parable, which Luke introduces by saying, then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. And as I've lived with this story all week, I find it's confounding. I mean, we hear a parable of Jesus and we sort of think that uh, we should find God in there, right? In the parable of the prodigal son, it's it's fun to think of uh, God as being like that prodigal father, the waiting father who rejoices in the return of the lost son and still loves the stick in the mud, older, crabby son who stayed home and is grumpy about the party. But this story, God is surely not at all like the unjust judge, huh? And while I've read some interesting suggestions that Maybe God is like the persistent widow, persistent in loving you. And maybe I might even have preached that in a sermon once or twice. That's quite a stretch. I like the suggestion that maybe we might see this as a compare and contrast sort of things. A few chapters earlier, Luke uh, tells us, that Jesus said, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. You know uh, that, right? Uh, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask them? You know that. And so it's been suggested that in, in this parable, it's like Jesus is saying, if even the most unjust of judges will finally relent, to ceaseless petitions of a defenseless widow, how much more will God, who is after all a good judge, answer your prayers? But I think this story has so much more to it than simply advice that God does listen to our prayers. Otherwise, why not just say that? As I've said, I find this parable confounding But you know what else is confounding? Life. (laughs) My life, as good as I have it, is confounding. The lives of those I love. And I suspect you could join me in saying the lives of those around us, about whom we care so much and for whom we pray so fervently, is confounding. The travails we read about in the paper, the lives of so many who struggle and strive and wonder and weep. It's confounding the problems that arise and the terrors that persist. And the faith that you and I have in God and the love of Jesus it will not make the confounding aspect of life any less so, will it? In fact, we may well limp along ourselves, wondering and wandering as we wrestle with God. If you think about it, as we look around us and see the difficulties of the world, it might only make sense to lose heart. What is it, every seven weeks we serve lunch together? And seven weeks later, we do it again and again and again. Each month we give to ELCA World Hunger in our noisy offering. We're going to have to do that again in a couple weeks, huh? And again and again. It's confounding, this life. Jesus told this parable about our need to pray always and to never lose heart. We live with a persistence in caring and encounter a persistence of need 
So many have read this parable and tried to identify where God is in the story. I think God is telling this story through Jesus Christ, speaking it to you, calling you to persistence in prayer in a world of ongoing difficulty and a constant need for justice. I think it's a story about life itself, which often does not seem just, often seems a struggle, but also bears the promise and presence of God, even in our wrestling, even in our limping, of our God who sends to us Jesus Christ, who gives himself for you and for all the world and calls you to forgiveness, life, and love. It's interesting, how does our parable end? And yet when the Son of Man comes, Jesus says, will he find faith on earth? It's so great to be back with you again joining you in song. For yet again, I've known it clearly. Yes, indeed, he will find faith on earth. He will find that God's love has uh, been made real in you, in your life, in your caring, and in your loving. Let us rejoice, and may our singing never cease. Amen.